Good morning and welcome to the worship service of the Lighthouse Methodist Church here in Boca Grande where we continue to receive the light, be the light, and share the light of Jesus Christ. We are grateful to be in worship here in our sanctuary, but we are also very thankful for all of you who are joining us and continue to join us online each week. We will be continuing to uh, adhere to safety protocols and we'll continue to have two services for the remainder of November. Um, for those of you who know the calendar, that means that next week we're gonna have to make an announcement about what we're gonna be doing in December, and uh, we'll let you know then, of course. A special welcome to any first-time visitors. Please complete the Connect card in the bulletin, and we have a small gift for you uh, out on the table in the narthex as you depart. This week, a letter from the finance office will go out with the current status of annual pledges. As everyone knows, this has been a challenging year. Staff and church council have been managing expenses very carefully, and we are counting on the usual year-end generosity so we can balance the operating budget. Based on the history of that generosity, the mission committee has continued to fulfill our total commissions to all our missions. A great job by the Missions Committee under the leadership of Peter and Elsa Soderberg. With that, I want to remind you that the offering plates are in the rear of the sanctuary and you can leave your tithes and offerings as you depart the service. We are so grateful for your continued support of our church and its missions. That concludes the announcements portion of the service and with the chiming of the Trinity, we will begin our worship service. So let's quiet our minds and hearts as we prepare for worship. Thank mm -hmm. you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning. <laughs> Let us rise together for the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God, a great ruler over heaven and earth. Let us pray. Almighty God. You raised Christ from the dead and established him as Lord over every rebellious power. Give us grace to serve him wisely and faithfully that the world may see his glorious inheritance among the saints and recognize the freedom of joyful obedience in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. down. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Good morning. I see new faces today. How exciting. What's that? Okay. We're going to get a chance to get to know each other in Sunday school, right? Okay, cool. So, tell me, do you guys like jokes? Eh. Not, not bad jokes? Yes? I have one, too. I'm going to tell you my joke. And so, how about knock-knock jokes? Knock-knock. Gladys. Gladys, almost Thanksgiving. Aren't you glad, too? Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> and so as we start preparing for Thanksgiving, everybody's getting ready for Thursday, right? Great day, great day. And so as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving and we remember to give thanks, one of the things that we need to give thanks for is laughter. 
That's a gift from God, right? And it makes us feel good. Don't you feel good when you're laughing? Makes you feel really good. And so when you look around the church and the things that here that are here that, that God has blessed us with that makes us feel good. So what about music? Does music make you feel good? We have great music in the church, don't we? We do. And, and, our, and the congregation, our church family, they all make us feel pretty good, don't they? Good answer. <laughs> and the cross on the wall, isn't that something we should give thanks for too? That reminds us of, of Jesus and, and his sacrifice for us, that God loved us so much that he gave us his son. And so all these things that God has given us just here in the church doesn't even count all the stuff that we get at home and, and when we're out and about, right? And so this is just one of, those, one of those moments when God just pours blessings out all over the place for us. And we can't take those for granted, can we? And so let me go to my instruction book here, our Bible. We always got to go here. Um, and I'm going to go to 1 Chronicles. It's uh, chapter 16, verse 34. And it tells us, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And we know that's true, don't we? Because God gives us laughter and music and a church family and a cross and so much more. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you pour out onto us every day. We thank you for that laughter and music and our church family and the cross and, and so many things that you give us. Help us to never take those for granted. Remind us that they are all a sign of your love for us. And we thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right. Should we go to Sunday school? Come on. Whoops, whoops, whoops.
us pray together the prayer for illumination. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts by the power of your Spirit, that we may know the hope to which we have been called. In Jesus Christ, amen. A reading from Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out, as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself, be, will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. A reading from Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison 
and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, if you would, whisper to the person next to you, God loves you and so do I. And we truly welcome all of you that are worshiping online with us this morning. Those in the congregation, can you just wave really quick? So they, we don't want you to feel alone there at home on your couch. But um, uh, we welcome all that are worshiping with us this morning. Uh, in, in Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize winning play, Our Town, uh, the play's central character, Emily, is given a chance following her death to view a scene from her past. She is told that it cannot be some obviously important day, but should be a fairly ordinary time from her bygone life. Indeed, she is told that revisiting even the least important day of her life would suffice to teach Emily something very important. So Emily chooses to visit her 12th birthday, only to discover a vast array of things about that day that she had completely forgotten. More than that, however, she is stunned to see how fast life moves and how little she or anyone paid attention to what was happening when it was happening. And in the end, Emily cannot bear to watch it. I can't, I can't go on, she cries. We don't have time to even look at one another. I didn't realize. So all that was going on and we never noticed. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute, she asked. And the answer is no. Instead, Emily is told, for the vast majority of people, what it means to be alive is to move around in a cloud of ignorance. Emily simply was not aware of the larger meaning around her every, every minute of every, every day, as she said. And sometimes the most important things for us, the most important things we do in life are things that it seems at the time really have no real significance. Today is the Sunday where we celebrate the reign of Christ, that Christ is King. It's the last Sunday in our lectionary cycle, and it ends today. Can you believe next week begins the season of Advent? How fast time has gone past us. The gospel reading today is as straightforward as it comes. The use of the groupings of sheep and goats was a way for Jesus' hearers to understand separation and to understand judgment. And they would have understood what he was saying as it was customary in this time for shepherds to separate goats and sheep at night. The goats really couldn't take the cold that well. So he would separate them. Or the sheep and the goats got in a head-butting fight and he would separate them. And Jesus does this and says this to his hearers. 
And we notice that on this Sunday, the main point of the text isn't the celebration of a king. It isn't a glorious representation of heaven with the multitudes bowing down and worshiping God, though we firmly believe that. We firmly believe that Christ reigns forever and ever and his kingdom will have no end. Rather, this text is about Christ coming in glory. Christ who is above all nations. Christ who is the final and eternal person. Ephesians 1.20 says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that can be named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So the main point of this text on this reign of Christ day is to acknowledge that there is definitely victory in Jesus and through Jesus' example to us, it's about how we serve people. How do we serve people who are hungry? People of thirst, people who are strangers, people who are without clothing, people who are sick, and people who are in prison. Really, what does the reign of Christ look like and how am I a part of it? Or otherwise, how can I not move around, as Emily was told, in, in a cloud of ignorance? It is clear to us this morning that the reign of Christ is about how we, Christ's followers on earth, interact and work with those who are the other. The hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the prisoner. And Christ reigns, and his reign is not only in us, in our congregation, but it is with those who we may least identify with, and it is with those whom Christ would have us identify with. And there are two ways this identity work actually works. I go back to the word we read in the text, nation. And in the Greek, nation means ethnos. This means a group of people. Not necessarily a geographically confined group of people, but a collective group of people with common similarities and cultures and understanding. The word nation does not mean nations the way we think of it in the 21st century. Because after all, there can be different collective groups of people in a single nation. But in this biblical context, Jesus is speaking of collective groups of people. So let's say, for example, the Lighthouse Church is a nation. There are those of us who are hungry, thirsty, strangers, without clothing, sick, and in prison? Really? Maybe not literally, but definitely figuratively. So church should be a place, first and foremost, where the gospel is proclaimed, a place of prayer, a place of healing, a place where no excuses are made that the reign of Christ is present among us, that Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life, and that you can find healing and wholeness for your lives. The second way this identity work actually works is personal. It's centered on how we personally interact with the least of these. And the fact is, people are everywhere carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders, while those who are under the reign of Christ often move about in a cloud of ignorance, enclosed and shut in, simply just unaware.
for me personally, I have to be with the poor, embraced by the poor, laugh with the poor, cry with the poor, support the poor on an ongoing basis. And yet it's the area of my life that needs the most improvement. I have to go on those mission trips, go to those local agencies and be there. And however, the call of Christ is so clear, I can't just do it through some organization. I have to do it myself. And I'd say for us all, we have to do it ourselves too. It is the only way to both maintain and gain perspective on the servant king whom we declare as Lord today. Friends, you are the only person that someone may come in contact with who meets the description of who Jesus is talking about. Not everyone in need is going to go to an organization or an ethnos or a nation. They're going to run into you. Jim Wallace, who is formerly of the Sojourners community, has said that we connect with the poor in two primary ways, television and statistics. These sometimes give us concern, which is a recognition that there is a problem. But true compassion, in contrast, is that feeling of real connectedness and relationship. So if you boil this down, it is a personal question for each of us. If you search who you are, where you go, and what you do, what you do, are your eyes open to those in desperate need? If Jesus were to ask you those questions, would you be able to say, yes, I gave you something to drink. I clothed you. I had compassion for you. Is there someone in your life, spiritually or physically, hungry or thirsty? Are they a stranger? Are they naked? Are they sick or in prison? They may look like everyone else, but on the inside, they need you to usher in the reign of Christ into their lives. In the movement of bringing hope to others, both as a church body, a nation, and as individuals, personally, friends, this is the closest we can experience the reign of Christ the King. Jesus the Lord did not frequent those places of prestige. Christ was among people of spiritual and physical need. That was where his kingdom was ushered in and experienced. This was the kingdom the apostles gave their lives to fulfill. This is the kingdom that we have inherited. Let us not go around in a cloud of ignorance. But let's fulfill our mission as a church and as followers of Christ. And let us thank God that we are part of the eternal inheritance in Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, one Thanksgiving season, a family was seated around their table looking and staring at the annual holiday bird. From the oldest to the youngest, they were to express their praise. When they came to the five-year-old in the family, he began looking at the turkey and expressing his thanks to the turkey saying although he had not yet tasted it, he knew it would be good. And after that rather novel expression of thanksgiving, he began with a more predictable line of credits, thanking his mother for cooking the turkey, thanking his father for buying the turkey. But then he went beyond that. He joined together a whole hidden multitude of benefactors, linking them with cause and effect. He said, I thank the checker at the grocery store who checked out the turkey. I thank the grocery store people who put it on the shelf. I thank the farmer who made it fat. I thank the man who made the feed. 
I thank those who brought the turkey to the store. And using his Columbo-like little mind, he traced the turkey all the way from its origin to his plate. And then at the end, he solemnly and sincerely asked everyone around the table, did I leave anybody out? And his two-year-old brother, embarrassed by his ranting and proceedings, said, God, you left out God. And solemnly and without being flustered at all, the five-year-old said, well, I was about to get to him. <laughs> well, isn't that the question about which we ought to think about on the reign of Christ and at Thanksgiving time? Are we really going to get to God? Today presents us another invitation for the way of God. That way is Jesus Christ. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the Prince of peace. He is the Savior of the world. He reigns forever and ever. And he is in love with you. Each of us can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Who offers us all the way and the joy of salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is in our salvation that we are led to be the hands and the feet and the body of Christ who can affirmatively answer the questions that we heard asked in the gospel passage. And as we grow in this relationship, it enlarges our worldview and it gives us purpose. We don't have to move around in a cloud of ignorance as a relationship with Jesus Christ gives us clarity and vision and joy and purpose. And to get God this Thanksgiving season and this holiday season, we are invited to accept that Jesus Christ is actually getting to us. And may you accept his sacrifice for humankind and for you. May you accept his love for you and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. In the end, May others look back on our lives and realize that the world has become a better place because we have helped others experience the reign of Christ in our time. And not because we played church or pushed political agendas, but because we were obedient to the gospel of the Lord whom we profess as Christ the King. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this holy season, and we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving. We accept Christ's love for us, we accept the forgiveness of our sins and we follow his way into the future. Give us eyes to see so the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know the hope to which we are called, and that we would serve those around us who are in need. Amen.
Scripture tells us that Jesus, our Lord, is seated at the right hand of the Father and intercedes on our behalf. I invite us this morning to follow in his steps and take the prayer list out of your bulletin and intercede for these persons who are listed. They have entrusted to us their needs, and we have committed to them that we would be praying for them. As Philip plays the Spirit song, I invite you possibly just to read the names in your mind of those on this list, and if you're familiar with any of the needs, say a special prayer for them, and then we will corporately pray together. Let's pray. Through Jesus Christ, God has shown us the sovereignty of divine love and compassion for the least, the lost, and the lonely. Therefore, we pray, saying, Compassionate Lord, hear our prayer. God, we live in a world of plenty in which the poor struggle for daily bread. We pray for those who lack the basic necessities of life and those who willingly share the resources you have given. Open our eyes to your presence among the poor in the world. Compassionate Lord, hear our prayer. God, you admonish us to offer hospitality to the stranger and to welcome the weary. We pray for travelers. We pray for those who find homes in new lands. Pray for those who are refugees of political and religious wars and for those who have no place to call home. Bless those who offer refuge to the wayfaring stranger. Convict the conscience and open the heart of any who would raise walls of self-preservation and isolation. 
for the stranger and for those who minister to them and for those who serve them. Compassionate Lord, receive our prayer. God, you hear the cry of all who are in distress. Heal those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, especially each person that is listed on our prayer list and those persons whom we carry in our hearts. Comfort them in their need and help those who care for them. Compassionate Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us to serve our sisters and brothers and to share the burden for the sick and those in distress. Compassionate Lord, receive our prayer. God, Jesus, our Lord, was a prisoner of Rome before his execution, and he instructed his disciples to visit those in prison. We pray for those who are incarcerated, for those who are guilty of crimes, and for those who may be unjustly imprisoned. Save the lost, reprove the hardy, liberate the captive. Let your disciples be signs of your love. We also pray for those who work in prisons, that they may respect the humanity of the women and men they guard and not be overwhelmed by the moral dangers that they may face. For prisoners and for those who minister to them, compassionate Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, confirm our prayer with the dedication of our lives to your ministry. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you are one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you again this morning for worshiping here at Lighthouse United Methodist Church, where all are always welcome. As we begin this holiday week, uh, Joy and I and little Ethan wish you all a very happy and blessed Thanksgiving. And let us all remember to thank God on this day and during this week. Would you rise for the benediction? May God who seeks the lost keep you. May God who brings back the wandering heart uphold you. May God who binds up the injured heal you. May God who strengthens the weak empower you now and forever. Go now in the peace and the love of God. Amen.